Tonight's featured speaker is no um, stranger to Pam. He's no stranger to many of us in the room. He's um, been part of numismatics for a long time, and he's part of numismatic history for sure. And uh, he's currently governor of ANA, and he's uh, done some great things uh, while he's participated in that. Uh, in his career, he did some great things as well at Krause Publications. He is a true advocate for our hobby. Please welcome Cliff Mitchell. Cliff? Well, oh, thank you, Don. And uh, before I uh, get started on my remarks here, which I'll try to not make them too long, you know, if you look at your program, it said that I was going to be the speaker, and then Ben and Abe were going to follow me. Now, that's like putting the major leagues out there against the minors. <laughs> and uh, I feel ill-prepared to entertain you, but I will try to uh, share a few facts with you on the American Numismatic Association and the hobby as I uh, see it. And before I start, however, you know, I, I was on a Zoom call on Monday, and it didn't materialize as planned, and so Kim and I and Donna from the uh, membership department were the only ones on the call. And as we were uh, deciding what we were going to do about rescheduling the call, uh, Kim says, uh, by the way, uh, you know I'm not going to uh, Pittsburgh, don't you? And I said, no, I hadn't heard anything about that. And so she said, uh, well, Tom didn't tell you that I had bowed out? And I said, Tom who? <laughs> <laughs> and she she uh, explained that she had this uh, family situation that really came first. And, uh, but she says, also, you know, Tom said he was going to call you and tell you you were going to speak in my place. But uh, I didn't get that message until I got here. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and that's not really Tom's fault, because somehow he managed to get my smartphone number, and he left messages on my smartphone. The only problem is I never answer my <laughs> So, So anyway, here we are. I heard his voice. <laughs> yeah, well, my daughter made me do that. So. Uh, I'm going to just share a, a few observations with you this evening about the ANA and about the hobby. And, this kind of uh, comes as an upshot of a talk that uh, Joe Bowling, uh, Shanna Schmidt, who are also board members of the ANA, and myself appeared at the Chicago Coin Club banquet back in this past December. And our program was to speak about the state of the ANA today and tomorrow. And there are a number of issues out there where the American Numismatic Association and our hobby are concerned. Uh, one of them is the matter of our national convention, the World's Fair of Money, in, uh, which is, you know, in Chicago this year, or Rosemont, and of course it's coming here to Pittsburgh next year, thankfully, after having gotten uh, sidelined in the year 2000 by COVID. And uh, I was pleased, in fact, as a board member to make the motion to make sure that Pittsburgh uh, was not forgotten uh, after that episode. Yeah. Now, that having been said, I'm not a person who actually favors moving the World's Fair of Money around the country. I'm in favor of anchoring it in Chicago because that's a more efficient and economical uh, approach to held in our national convention. And I think, uh, in my experience, that it's much more practical to bring 
a big show and settle it in a city and then bring people there than it is to take a big show out around the country. And you no know, disrespect for Pittsburgh because as I say, I supported coming to Pittsburgh because we had that prior commitment. But in the long run, I actually favor uh, the show being set, uh, anchored in Chicago. And I think it will be, although probably not on an every year basis, but probably something like three years out of four or something like that, so that they get the efficiency aspects. The National Money Show, uh, on the other hand, which uh, the uh, Pittsburgh, you had the National Money Show a number of years ago. In fact, you had the National Money Show 2, which was a fall show, of which there were only two of them. And, uh, they decided after them, actually after the first one, which didn't make any money for the ANA, that they uh, should uh, not continue that experiment with a fall show, which was probably a practical uh, thing. But I, I really feel that when you can't make money on a show as the American Numismatic Association, you're probably not spending your money wisely in uh, running a national money show. And I don't see any way in the world how the national money show will ever make money. Uh, this past year, we also eliminated, eliminated PNG Day and uh, introduced in its place a dealer day. And uh, that's created a little bit of controversy, particularly with the management of PNG. And uh, Give me about 30 seconds. I can make However, a call for the response from dealers and other participants participants has been very positive where Dealer Day is concerned. As Cliff and I run that program and we have Russ ANA convention. <laughs> um, one of the things that is really impacting the uh, American Numismatic Association, and I know central states, and I think the fun organization too is the change that has been rock in recent years where the auction business is concerned because uh, big auction companies have all discovered that you know they can hold, hold an auction in Podunk. They don't need with the internet and all, in fact, as all of you, many of you at least well know, uh, many of the bidders in, in a ANA National or an ANA World Ceremony Auction or a fun auction, uh, many of the bidders are up in their room bidding on their computer instead of down in the auction room. You go into an auction room today, and, and quite often, if you see three or four people sitting in a room that used to be packed, uh, that's where it is. Uh, we also in December spoke about the COVID protocols, but. I think that's uh, almost a, becoming a dead issue, at least I hope it's, hey, I shouldn't say dead, should I? <laughs> that was the wrong term. Uh, well, I had to bring a little humor into it anyway. So. Uh, in the education area, uh, the Dwight Manley uh, Library out at Colorado Springs is again uh, available in full service, and most recently uh, our Great, great donor in that area, Dwight Manley, uh, brought the uh, nucleus of the Baker auction, which actually goes into the museum and gave it to the ANA. And more recently, he acquired a lot of the materials out of the very impressive Sid Martin Library on uh, early American numismatics. And uh, he donated them to the uh, ANA library, which uh, I don't think is general knowledge. Is yet, Bill Shamhart is still doing stuff for Summer Seminar? Uh, summer Seminar, uh, uh, don't know. I understand, is, is. Uh, looking a little bit weak this year in comparison to what uh, pre-COVID experience uh, had been. Uh, and, you know, that's probably natural that, that that's going to happen, but the Summer Seminar is definitely one of these signal events on a, the annual numismatic calendar. Um, the role of the <coughs> Hedero C. Rochette Money Museum, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it uh, now holds the Baker Collection of Washington. 
Uh, also, it is losing, as many of you, or most of you probably are aware, it's losing the Bass Collection, which was on loan for the past 22 or 23 years. That's a and, uh, the, uh, uh, Doug Mudd, the curator of the museum, is in the process of developing some uh, alternative plans for how that space will be used going forward. Uh, let's see. We learn an issue that I don't know much about, as I tell those on the board who know something about it. Uh, I won't bother to debate with you. When you get done arguing your points, I'll vote. But, uh, you know, I believe very sincerely, uh, coming out of the publishing background that I do, I believe very seriously in, in you know, ink on paper. And uh, I know the future, however, is going in this direction of electronics more and more all the time, and it is the future, and we should not neglect it, but we don't want to forget uh, our base. The marketing, the numismatist is the most valuable uh, element of the uh, marketing of the American Numismatic Association. There was a proposal that was made to, for the AMA to be, become more fiscally efficient, that maybe it should reduce the number of issues of the numismatist from monthly to nine issues a year or something like that. Uh, I was very vehemently opposed to that. I don't. I hope it won't go anywhere because uh, when you reduce the, when you interrupt the frequency of a publication, you interrupt the attachment to your audience because your audience, if they're used to getting a monthly publication, they don't want to think, well, am I going to get one this month or are they going to skip this month? Or the same thing if, if you're looking at weekly. So, uh, I hope that never happens. I don't think there's a strong feeling in favor of it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'm not in favor of the National Money Show continuing. However, uh, I would be and have spoken very much in favor of uh, doing renewing what is called the road show, which is to take some of our valuables out. And for instance, uh, at either the spring or fall pan show, develop an associ association program with the PAN organization whereby we bring some strong things out that would be benefit to both PAN and to the ANA as far as drawing uh, audience and everything. Actually, the South Carolina Numismatic Association, which this fall on uh, Halloween weekend will be holding their 50th anniversary convention, uh, are going to bring the road show down to South Carolina. So. Uh, that would be a, a good experiment to see if we should uh, look to replace the National Money Show with uh, the uh, ANA Road Show. Uh, oh, one of the things that the ANA has never done uh, very effectively, I don't think, is to really determine what the nature of their audience is. We, we say that, well, you know, we're 55 and male. And, you know, certainly we are 55 or older and, and male. But I can tell you from my experience at Krause Publications, you know, we have a lot more, a lot larger universe to work with. But we have, you know, well over a million subscribers to our various periodicals that we were publishing, of which numismatics, of course, was a relatively small percentage. But we surveyed those audiences very actively, and we knew, for instance, that if we wanted to reach out to get some new numismatic news subscribers, that we could go to names and addresses that we had captured in our gun publications, because that was the second favorite collectible area that our numismatic people in it indicated was their interest, you know. Now, uh, Don, we never uh, ask about these plaques that goes on the wall for $10,000 or anything like that. But the point is, you know, the ANA has, has always kind of explored internally 
within the numismatic community in reaching out for new members. And uh, they really need to reach outside of the numismatic community, but you can't do it on a shotgun basis. You, you have to develop some demographic uh, controls in order to be successful. Uh, the ANA has a great fortune in that we have something called the Benny Keith Fund. And, and that is a fund that uh, in recent years has grown on the order of excess of a million dollars a year. So, I don't know, we now have something like 48 million or something in a, an asset out there. And there are some people within the organization that think we, you know, for instance, uh, getting more involved in this electronic universe, we should just go out and spend whatever we need to spend to get uh, more successful in that field. And, uh, you know, we certainly need to use some of those funds to invest in these kind of expansions, but we, we dare some not uh, use that Benny Keith fund for operational expenses. So we, we need to control our operational expenses. And I know Tom, in the period of time he sat on the board, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, uh, with that, I'd like to just offer a few observations on my experience at Crowsey Publications. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, Numismatic News was founded on October 13th of 1952. So this year, this fall, it will be celebrating its 70th anniversary as a numismatic publication or a numismatic, uh, publication of our numismatic community. And that makes it the longest live uh, publication in the hobby. And actually, uh, one of the longer live publications, other than the Saturday evening post. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, uh, it has a great heritage. And I just would like to observe that, however, in 1960. 566, it almost ceased to exist. Now, those of you who were around in the hobby at the time, remember that after the great boom of the 1950s and the early 1960s, there were a lot of people darn near went broke. A lot of coin clubs uh, died uh, in uh, that period of time because of the coin shortage that, that uh, our wonderful friend, uh, the mint director, Eva Adams, wanted to blame on coin collectors. It wasn't a lack of foresight on the government or anything like that. That would never happen. But, uh, and how well we know that today. Uh, coming out of that experience, oh, by the way, one of the, one of the things that that experience brought home to me was the value of somebody who has been mentioned uh, several times here uh, by Tom, I guess. That's Chet Krause, who founded Numismatic News. And at the time, uh, in that 65, 66 period, when Numismatic News and the other publications from Iowa were struggling, Chet Krause had a pretty substantial collection of national bank notes that he had gathered up uh, in the boom years of the late 50s and early 60s. and. Uh, he, but he was having trouble making sure that he could meet the payroll. So he sold his national banknote collection to make sure that he could pay the payroll. Now, I was one of the people that was in that payroll, so I was kind of happy that he did that at the time, you know. So. But uh, fortunately, he was able to resurrect that later when things turned around. Uh, we diversified uh, then coming out of that, starting coin prices, standard catalog of world coins, world coin news, sports collectors digest, uh, and a plethora of, of other collectible publications. At one time, we, we were very unhealthily at a 50% revenue level with the sports card or sports memorabilia field, at which time the numismatic field was probably only 12 to 15%. That was a very unhealthy situation, of course. And however, uh, that would have been around the year 2000 
but the publishing that was pre uh, pre uh, eBay days and uh, things like that that had a lot of impact on the uh, hobbies. Uh, going through that experience, we developed a, a theory that we call the three-legged stool. And if any of you were born and raised on a dairy farm, you know what a three-legged stool was. It was what the the uh, milkman, the cow, cow milker, whatever you call him. I can't get the name out right now. But anyway, when he sat down under the udder of the cow to milk the cow, he had a three-legged stool because uh, it was a very stable stool. It wouldn't tip over like a four-legged stool would have uh, an inclination to do. But we developed a, a theory that every hobby that we became involved in should have a shopper like Numismatic News. It should have a magazine like Coins Magazine, and it should have a catalog or a price guide like the standard catalog of World Coins. And so we, we developed that same theory uh, through the sports memorabilia field, uh, through the uh, car field, and, you know, and the various other fields that we were involved in. So, uh, now, get to this Distinguished Service Award, which was uh, referenced previously. You know, in 1952, the ANA established a new award, which was uh, uh, at the instigation of a uh, dealer from New York who was the Sergeant of Arms, Sergeant at Arms of the American Numismatic Association. He was, uh, his name was Lou Werner. And uh, he wasn't on the board, but he was a Sergeant at Arms, as I mentioned. And, Lou was not affectionately known as Moneyback Lou Moneyback Werner. And he was known as Moneyback because he never gave money back if he made a mistake. Mm -hmm. so, uh, he, he earned the reputation. But anyway, he named, the, he was influ influential in making the uh, designated name of the award as the Ferenc Zerbe Award. That award was named after an individual who was very instrumental in the early years of growth of the American Numismatic Association, but he also had a cloudy um, background. And however, that award was never sponsored. And so a number of years ago, uh, an individual came forward and would sponsor the award, and I think he did that for eight to 10 years. But most recently, he decided not to continue sponsoring the award. At that time, the uh, a and &E, uh, board was charged, and I was on the board by that time, was charged with looking out to see what they could do to, to get funding of that award in the long term. And it was decided that the thing to do would be to change the name of the award and to raise uh, $75,000, as Don had mentioned earlier. And I was, I was never, a part of the discussions, and I did not vote. And I'm not one who abstains from voting on issues. I, I tend to vote on every issue, but I felt that I had a prejudicial uh, exposure in the case of them bringing up the name of Chet Krause to be the award recipient. Well, I'm very pleased, of course, that uh, they made that decision. and. Of course, the, the first recipient, as mentioned earlier this evening, will be Tom Urim. And I think, you know, at this point, I think we ought to give Tom a rousing support. Thank you. Thank you all. Tom is certainly the epitome of what we refer to when we call some, somebody with distinguished service to the American Numismatic Association, to the Pennsylvania Association of Numismatists, or to what I like to refer as the global coin collecting community. We're, we're best when we're all together as opposed to when we're units fighting one another. 
And uh, I don't know, I think uh, I probably bored you long enough. Thank you. <laughs>